ونعوذ بالله من شر انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا ما يهدي الله فلا مضل له وما يضل فلا تجد له وليا مرشدا we're actually going to go into a different segment in surah al-kahf and it, we're going to start it right here wa idh qala musa li fatahu la abrahu hatta ablugha majma'a al-bahrayn aw amdiya huquba the story this story is and um, something really interesting that I liked that Al-Tahir ibn Ashur. Al-Tahir ibn Ashur is a Tunisian scholar. Al-Tahir ibn Ashur, he mentioned something really interesting that all the Mufassirin, at least, that I went to did not realize it. He said, in the story of, in the stories, in Surah Al-Kahf, there is a combination in most of them. And that is, in the in the story of Al Kahf, they're they're on a journey for the sake of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. They leave their hometown to go for the sake of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. In the story, in the story of the uh, Musa, he's on a journey for the sake of seeking ilm. In the story of Dhul Qarnayn, he's on a journey to bring in justice. So each one is doing some kind of a travel, a different journey for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but one is doing it for the sake of Allah, for their faith, and the second is doing it for seeking ilm, and the third is doing it for the sake of justice. Let's do it again. In Tahir ibn Ashur, who's a Tunisian scholar and a mufassir, who died, I believe, in the 70s, um, he mentioned one interesting thing. He said that there's a there's a pattern in the stories that were mentioned in Surah Al-Kahf. Story number one is those guys going on a journey. Story uh, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Story number the two, the people of the cave. Story number two is Prophet Musa alayhi salam going on a journey to seek ilm. With al-Khadr. Um, story number three it was Dhul Qarnayn going on a journey and to implement justice. So it, the story, although there is one story, which is the guy that, you know, the, the Ashab al-Sahab al the, the guy that has two, um, two gardens, although there isn't necessarily a journey, but during a journey, there's always going to be conversations. And that's a conversation where it's directing directing you into looking at things from a different perspective. So Surah Al-Kahf is one of those rare journeys in life, rare journeys in how do you change from one place to another, and how do you direct your sight, and how do you direct your motives to being for a great cause. Now here, the story of Musa alayhi salam, وَإِذْ قَالَ مُوسَى لِفَتَاهِ Now, وَإِذْ قَالَ مُوسَى لِفَتَاهِ What you realize is that it says, وَإِذْ قَالَ مُوسَى لِفَتَاهِ So, the wa, always, whenever you have a wa, that, well, not always, if it's a harf atf, it, the usually, let's do it that way, if there is a wa, that means this is an addition to a previous story that was mentioned. So here, وَإِذْ قَالَ مُوسَى it is exactly like what qala rabbuka lil malaika so this is continuing the pattern that the surah was uh, that the surah was going into so it's a very coherent idea in where it starts out telling you those journeys and then it continues well remember that as an example and remember the other uh, story as an example when prophet musa when Prophet Musa tells Lifateh. Now, Lifateh, some scholars said that it was Yusha ibn Nun, and other scholars said it was somebody that was working with him, somebody that was, you know, like his maid, servant, whatever it is, Lifateh. But the ayah still commented, although called it Lifateh, like the, the, the person that was working with him, still called him like his son. لا أبرح حتى أبلغ مجمع البحرين. لا أبرح, meaning, I will not 
I will not sit still. I will not um, uh, deter. That's that's a better word. Deter away until Abelura, until I reach uh, where the two rivers meet or the two seas meet. Where were the two seas? Scholars had different opinions. Are we talking about the seas in uh, the sea where the Jordan River meets with with um, Tabaria or Tiberias, or are we talking about other places? But in the end is that it's pretty much around that area, pretty much around that area where um, where the, hold on, let me just make sure, where um, where Prophet Musa alayhi was was uh, was in, so it was it wasn't very far, and he said, "I'm going to be reaching the areas where the two seas meet, or I even if it takes me years and years or decades." Every hukba is like eighty years, so we're talking about even if it takes me forever. What was Prophet Musa alayhi salam going for? There is actually a hadith that mentions this. And this hadith is actually in Sahih al-Bukhari. We cannot explain this ayah without that hadith. The hadith goes that Prophet Musa alayhi salam thought when he was asked, Are you the most knowledgeable person on earth? And he said, yes. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to discipline Prophet Musa alayhi salam. What I mean by discipline, not the discipline that 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 we do because of faults. But even the Prophet Sallam says, Addabani Rabbi wa ahsana ta'dibi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had disciplined me and made it a, a great or a, a, a highly disciplined one. Now when we look at that, sorry let me just this is the hotline and people can actually call in order to ask questions but sometimes um, it goes in the wrong time anyhow uh, so the, the hadith says that that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him that no you're not the most knowledgeable person travel to a place where the two seas meet and put a fish in a bucket that fish was put in a bucket and when you lose the fish that's where that person that you're supposed to be learning from is going to be in all right a fish in a bucket you're going to be going to a sea where the two seas meet and that's where you're whenever you lose the fish that's where the man should be Simple? Simple. Prophet Musa alayhi salam goes along with this lad, let's call him that way, that is with him. The hadith continues that when they, the hadith continues this ayah, that when they reached the area where the two seas meet, it must have been a little space somehow. Prophet Musa gets tired, goes to sleep. The fish gets out of the bucket, but his maid servant decides that I'll just tell him that the fish went out of the bucket later. The fish gets out of the bucket. Prophet Musa wakes up and they're still carrying the bucket, didn't realize anything about the fish. So, Prophet Musa alayhi salam, when he continues, nasiya hutahuma, they forget the whole issue about the fish. They forget the whole issue about the fish, and so does the lad. So here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that both of them forgot. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, nasiya hutahuma. Now, this is very important to mention that even if you give somebody the responsibility, you as a leader, you are still considered responsible. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's both of you. A absolutely. Both of you forgot. Okay, he is the one that is the made for, that is the one that forgot. 
but both of you, because you've got a certain responsibility as a leader to mentor and watch over to make sure that the that the uh, that the mission is under control and everything's met. فَاتَّخَذَ سَبِيلَهُ فِي الْبَحْرِ سَرَبَ The fish, it didn't go back to the ocean really. It stayed within a certain parameter. All right? Now, فَلَمَّا جَاوَزَ They continue walking in search for the man. Well, waiting really, not in search for the man, but waiting whenever they would lose the fish. When they reach a certain point, فَلَمَّا جَاوَزَ They kind of went farther than the area, than the premise that they were supposed to be in. He tells his, his the, the servant, أَتِنَا غَدَاءَنَا Bring us the food. غَدَاءَنَا So it looks like غَدَاء is dinner. قَدْ لَقِينَا مِنْ سَفِنَا No, dinner. لَقَدْ لَقِينَا مِنْ سَفَرِنَا هَذَا نَصَبَا we're really getting tired. What happened? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made him feel that fatigue in order to second, to, to give him a, a hint, a, a, you know, a, a, a hint that, wait a minute, you went too far. So the, the, child, the, the maid tells him, how about we go back to the stone that we were near? near those two seas because I forgot the fish there and I forgot to tell you about it because shaitan made me forget it. So they go back with complete surprise. Now, complete surprise, like that was the main sign that losing the fish and getting the, the, that the fish was going to get out of the bucket somehow and goes was going to was going to swim off, and you forgot to tell it to so me. Question. Yes. Did he just decide from anyway he's going to go where the two seeds meet? And then that was no. Told, it was wahi. He was told by Allah subhanahu wa taala. Okay, go for a journey. Go for a journey. No, fish. no. There's a guy that you're going to meet, and you didn't have a GPS, but they're going to give you two hints. It's going to be where the two seas meet. You've got a fish. When you lose that fish, that's when you would know that that man is not far from that area. All right? So now here, very important to say, he says, The reason why that maid, so the maid is saying, well, the reason why I forgot it was really the shaitan was putting a challenge, did not want me to remember to remember that the fish has gone, therefore we're in that area. So he said, So that's exactly what we're looking for. We just, at least we know where the fish is at, where, where the fish swam um, off. So they decided, all right, well, that's where the fish was. Let's go fetch it. Let's see where, where um, it went. Because at least he knows that in that, over that, or near that big rock, that we left, the, or that's where the fish, where we, we last saw, saw the fish. So they went back to that rock, and the qasasa, meaning in search of that man that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given him a sign that that's where he's going to be about. فَوَجَدَ عَبَدًا مِّنْ عِبَادِنَا They go back, so they find one of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's servants. In fact, in the hadith, it actually says that he said to him, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. He tells him, Assalamu alaikum. And the guy was surprised. Oh, I'm not in a city that knows Assalamu alaikum. So that's when he knows that he's actually a good servant. آتَيْنَاهُ رَحْمَةً مِّنْ عِنْدِنَا So he finds a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is the name Al-Khadr really? Um, there are certain narrations that say that his name is Al-Khadr. Um, so this man Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes that we had given him mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And we had taught him from certain ilm, given him certain ilm from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The certain ilm from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given him, this man is not a prophet or a messenger, but this man has ilm called ilm al ladun. So it's some ilm that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given this man, not necessarily is it wahi. Can somebody claim to have ilm al ladun? Nobody can claim to have ilm al ladun. But this man, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assigned and told us that he has this ilm al ladun, and that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent um, Prophet Musa alayhi salam to learn from this man. Qala lahu Musa, so Musa alayhi salam starts his journey on acquiring ilm. Yep. So he starts his journey on acquiring ilm, and then he says, Hal attabiruka? Can I follow you so you could teach me what you had learned Rushda, like the guidance that you had learned. So he says, you're not going to be able to cope or have patience to learn. Why wasn't he going to have patience? Because he was going to hurry in getting the cut to the consequence. In other words, for seeking ilm, you have to take the steps and you have to go gradual in getting the ilm and rushing to get to the consequence was going to lead in you losing the ilm. So, and he tells him why he wasn't going to be patient. He says, وَكَيْفَ تَصْبِرُ عَلَى مَا لَمْ تُحِطْ بِهِ خُبْرًا how are you going to be patient on matters that you don't really know the details? In other words, you lack data about all what surrounds those stories. Some stories, you're not going to be able to be patient when you might see me taking a certain move or a certain tactic. قَالَ سَتَجِدُنِي إِن شَاءَ اللَّهُ صَابِرًا he said, you'll see me, inshallah, by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, patient. And I will not disobey you in any matter. Let's see. Then he says, well, if you follow me, don't ask me on any matter until I tell you about the case. فَلَا تَسْأَلْنِي عَنْ شَيْءٍ حَتَّى أُحْدِثَ لَكَ مِنْهُ ذِكْرًا Don't ask me questions. Why is he not, is he not going to necessarily tell him the details? No. He's, he's going to be the teacher. And the first thing that he wants to teach him is that not necessarily in the beginning of education, you don't necessarily have to know all the details and the end and where your teacher might be taking you. So test, his test his patience or test his ability to see the ilm and understand how to be humble in seeking ilm. Now, when we say being humble in seeking ilm, we usually, as humans, we usually rush to the consequences. We usually rush to wanting to know, well, why did you do this? And sometimes we become so rigid, this is we, not Prophet Musa alayhi salam, but we as humans, we might lose our temper, or we might, wa alaykum salam, we might lose our temper, or sometimes even lose, lose our, our, um, our, the, the levels of how we seek the ilm. So, so he says, فَانْطَلَقَ فَانْطَلَقَ means they, they, انطلقَ انطلقَ means that they went off. حتى إذا ركب في السفينة خرقها. They went off. They ride on a ship. And what he did with the ship was something different. خرقها. He made a hole inside that ship. Prophet Musa alayhi salam was watching. قال أخرقتها لتغرق أهلها. Now Prophet Musa alayhi salam in awe, surprised. He said, did you, did you put a hole in the ship 
لتغرق. Now this lamb is actually the lamb to to give about the explanation. لتغرق أهلها. Did you do it in order to um to have the its people, in other words, the people that are riding on the ship, to sink? لتغرق أهلها. لقد جئت شيئا إمرا. You have come with a matter that is that that is like a sin. It was not acceptable. قال ألم أقول لك إنك لن تستطيع معي صبرا. He said, didn't I tell you that you are not going to be able to be patient in seeking علم. قال لا تؤخذني بما نسيت. He said, لا تؤخذني. لا تؤخذني. It's like oh, don't don't hold don't hold me accountable. Don't hold me accountable. Don't consider me. As committing, you know, or going transgressing my mil my limits, be manasi because I had forgotten, I had forgotten my, um, I had forgotten what you had taught me, um, in the beginning of this this class. It's like don't don't be don't hold don't hold me accountable for more than what I can handle. Then they went off again. حتى إذا لقي غلاما فقتله. He sees a child. غلام means a child. So he sees a child, and what does he do with the child? He actually kills the child. قال أقتلت نفسا زكية بغير نفس. Then Prophet Musa عليه السلام gets furious, and he says, "Did you just kill an innocent soul that has not?" Killed anybody else? In other words, what is the whole idea? Nafsam bighayri nafs. Nafsam bighayri nafs is because in the Sharia of Prophet Musa alayhi salam, the only reason why you could kill somebody is when, as a punishment, when they had committed homicide. So this person didn't kill anybody. How could you kill somebody like that? Laqad jita shay'an nukra. Laqad. جئت شيء النكرة meaning you had committed a major sin now this is prophet Musa عليه السلام again قال ألم أقول لك إنك لن تستطيع معي صبرا did I did I not tell you that you will not be able to be patient with me again قال إن سألتك عن شيء بعدها فلا تصاحبي he said prophet Musa عليه السلام Again, Prophet Musa alayhi salam is watching, but he didn't realize that those were part of the lessons. Not on the carpet, on the book. Prophet Musa alayhi salam didn't realize that that was part of the lesson. So whenever he sees him doing something, he would consider it as, oh, you committed a major, a major thing. Didn't realize that that was part of the lesson. قال إن سألتك عن شيء بعدها فلا تصاحبني. So Prophet Musa alayhi salam just excuses himself and says, you know, if I ask you about one more thing, فل, um, فلا تصاحبني. Don't take me with you. It's like, okay, you'll have a good excuse. قد بلغت من لدني عذرا. Then you would have the excuse from my side that I don't have the patience to be a good student of Ilm. فَانْطَلَقَ Then they went off again. حَتَّى إِذَا أَتَيَا أَهْلَ قَرْيَةٍ إِسْتَطَعَمَا أَهْلَهَا They went off. They came, acro they came across a, um, a city. City, village. Il Qariya can be a city and can be a village. Istata'ama ahlaha. What is istata'ama? They asked them to give them food. They were hungry. They asked them. Whenever the letter, the, the letters alif and sin and ta come before a verb, that means they request. So I would say istaghfara means requested forgiveness. Istata'ama requested food. All right? Now, this means that they requested food from the people, the residents of that village. فأبو. 
They refuse to give them any food. They refuse to give them any food in any form of hospitality. فَوَجَدَ فِيهَا جِدَارَ يُرِيدُ أَيًّا قَدَّ فَأَقَى And they found a wall. يُرِيدُ أَيًّا قَدَّ فَأَقَى That it was about to... That was about to lean and they get demolished. So then they fixed it. Now, a very important lefta. It's like just a... Um, some scholars said... For, فَوَجَدَ فِيهَا جِدَارَ يُرِيدُ أَيًّا قَدَّ فَأَقَامَ That the jidar, the wall itself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the jidar yuridu. That the, that the wall was willing. Does that mean that objects have will or do they, do they live within an outside will? Does that mean that the chair has a will? The wall has a will? And even when you look at in Surah Al-Kaf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Kaf when he was talking about, about the, the two guys in the, in the Jannatain, in the two gardens, the ayah actually said that فَلَمْ وَلَمْ تَظْلِمْ مِنْهُ شَيْئًا That the earth was giving the man all that it can. وَلَمْ تَظْلِمْ مِنْهُ شَيْئًا Now, the, the ayat were putting some kind of a referral that earth was giving lam tazlim, the earth was not oppressing the man and was giving him everything that he was harvesting. This is earth. And now it's saying jidar yurid, that the wall wants to, was willing. Does that mean that Allah, are, do you see the pattern here? Does that mean that earth, wall, and that the things around us have a will? Well, one thing is that there, when we talk about irada, when we talk about irada, il irada is actually different kinds. When we talk about il qada wal qadar, Il qada wal qadar. Il qada wal qadar, there's an irada kawniya and an irada shar'iya. So when we talk about irada kawniya, so we look at, for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Iblis alayhi salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created people and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them the free will. So why won't he punish them right on the spot because of all that they're doing? There's an irada kawniya and irada shar'iya. What is irada kawniya? Irada kawniya means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put in the put a certain pattern in the world, gave a certain pattern, free will. There's a certain pattern in all over the creation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given. Even the the objects around us, they act within within the will and that physics is part of the will the earth lam tazlim there's a certain there's a certain biology there's a certain physics within earth that you harvest it it gives wall you put it up you um it it uh, if you don't put it up, it can lean, it can demolish, etc. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that there is that irada kawniya, that there is this uh, this will in the things around us. But, il irada shar'iya is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not will. Yes, you can choose to do kufr, you can't choose to go against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will, but not against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will to mean al-irada al-kawniya. You can't go and decide, oh, I want to live my life longer and actually prolong your life. But what you can do is you can decide that I want to do al-irada shar'iya and do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts me to do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants me to do my salah, I will do my salah. Now, what we're talking about is two wills. One will that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had instilled in the creation, and another will is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts 
and is content over. These are two different things. All right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Iblis, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was not content over Iblis. Are you guys with me here? Now, and right here that the wall was going, the wall had the will to fall over. Yuridu ayyam qadda. The wall was willing, was about to fall and get demolished. So what does that man do? Fa'aqama. He basically fixes the wall and puts it up. Prophet Musa alayhi salam says, قَالَ لَوْ شِئْتَ لَتَّخَذْتَ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرَ If you want, you could have you could have requested for a compensation for the wall that you put up. قَالَ هَذَا فِرَاقُ بَيْنِي وَبَيْنِكَ The man, he just said, that's it. Now we're separating. It's three chances. You were not patient. You were not patient to seek the ilm. You were not patient to get into, into the levels of seeking ilm. You rushed into going into the consequence. Now, what was the whole story here? The whole story was really to teach Prophet Musa alayhi salam that in order to get ilm, you need patience. That's the first beginning of it. Number two is that Prophet Musa alayhi salam went off the first, went off from the first lesson. In order to get ilm, you need to be patient. And he has shown that he wasn't even patient in the first three lessons. Let's continue. Said that's it. This is a separation between you and I. Now, I'm going to tell you the interpretation and the details of what you weren't able to be patient in learning. You, you, you didn't have the patience to wait until you get to the, until you get to the, to the theme of the, 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 the lesson. You didn't want to wait. Wake up. Or you can eat, drink something. Emma Safina. So now he's starting to tell him what what he was losing out on, and that there was a theme in acquiring this ilm. Emma Safina. As for the ship, فكانت لمساكين يعملون في البحر. The ship was owned by poor people. يعملون في البحر. They were basically Men that worked in the sea. In other words, that ship pretty much made their main, their main source of income. فأردت أن أعيبها. So I wanted to somehow make it in, you know, default it somehow. In the reason why, because وكان وراءهم, وكان وراءهم. It doesn't mean that there was behind them. In Arabic, sometimes you could say a word that would mean the opposite. وَكَانَ وَرَأَهُمْ means there was going to be ahead of them. مَلِكُ يَأْخُذُ كُلَّ سَفِينَةٍ غَصْبًا There was a king. Every time he sees a ship that is in good shape, he would take it. And because these guys are poor people, poor, uh, poor uh, fishermen and poor men, that, was, that ship was their only source of income. The guys may not have realized that that evil thing that had happened was actually for their sake. Because if that ship did not have any default, then they would lose the whole thing. They would lose the whole ship. Why? Because there was a king, a, a, a king that was a, an oppressor that was taking over every good ship. So he said, I just wanted to do something to ruin it. That way they could at least, in, they could manage still the ship without, without, um, lo well, they could, they could keep the ship that way. They could keep the ship 
even if they might have some defaults in it. But it's still better than losing the whole thing. وَأَمَّا الْغُلَامِ As for that young boy that he killed, فَكَانَ أَبَوَاهُ مُؤْمِنَيْنِ his, his parents were pious parents. فَخَشِينَ أَنْ يُرْهِقْهُمَا طُغْيَانَ وَكُفْرًا Notice here. He said, فَخَشِينَ Who's na? فَخَشِينَ means we feared. In other words, that man did not kill the boy out of his own expectation. But it was something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given him, some wahi, even though he's not a prophet, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given him some wahi that to kill that child was permissible. And that's why he said, فَخَشِينَ We feared, that is, he got some wahi, he got some information from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's, what, that's why he said, not فَخَشِيتُ but he said, فَخَشِيْنَا That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given him some ilm, and this is ilm al ladun, some ilm that that child was going to be a fitna, a trial on his parents. Why? Because that boy was a very, let's just call it a naughty boy. فَخَشِيْنَا أَنْ يُرْهِقْهُمَا we feared that that was going to that was going to harm the parents in the future by causing them a lot of distress the word distress anxiety what is to transgress the limit taha means to transgress any limit wa and al-kufr is denying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or going against the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَأَرَادَ رَبُّكُ فَأَرَدْنَا أَيُّ بْدِلَهُمَا Who's فَأَرَدْنَا? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted him, that man, to kill the boy because if that boy was, was going to stay alive, that boy was a bad boy, a naughty boy. That boy was a disbeliever. It's not... Did he reach the age of puberty or not? So when we look at al-ghulam, al-ghulam is within not a child that age, but we're looking at a child. So al-ghulam is more um, above. So we're we're talking about al-ghulam. What was that? Preteen, preteen within preteen teenager within that area. La al fata is different. Because il, 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 the, the ayah when it says um, that قَالَ لِفَتَاهُ This was more that he was treating him like his own son. He was treating his servant like his own son. Alright? الْفَتَاتِ is for girl. فَتَا فَتَاهُ is, is a boy. He's, he was his mate. فِتْيَ youth. Youth. They, they were in the age of puberty. They hit it. They went beyond that. Alright? فَأَرَدْنَا أَن يُبْدِلَهُمَا رَبُّهُمَا خَيْرًا So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to replace instead of that boy that was if he were to stay alive that was going to bring about lots of stress to the parents that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to replace those two parents something better. زَكَاةً وَأَقْرَبَ رُحْمًا This is amazing. فَأَرَدْنَا أَن يُبْدِلَهُمَا رَبُّهُمَا خَيْرًا مِنْهُ زَكَاةً That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to replace, instead of that child, wanted to replace them zakatan. What is zakat? Zakat is a purification. Is the death of a child a purification? What? If they're patient, yes. If they're patient? Well, you see, when we look at evil, when we look at evil, in Islam, the way we perceive evil is totally different than the way that non-Muslims may perceive evil. This is called theodicy in philosophy. Theodicy, the question of evil. Theod in, in theodicy, when we look at evil, 
For a mu'min, and this is really important to mention when we talk about psychology, a lot of times they look at psychology and they would talk about three dimensions. The dimension of the understanding of evil itself, trauma, our purpose of life, and how to cope with the trauma, therapy. All right? So in Islam, these three dimensions are totally different from the Western dimension of treating trauma and treating how people face evil. All right? So here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us that evil, the evil that puts you in your life might actually be something that will get you into a, a, in, a, in a situation of tezkiya. What is tezkiya? Remember the ayah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَمَا يُوقَ شُحَّ نَفْسِهِ يُوقَ شُحَّ نَفْسِهِ What is شُحَّ نَفْسِهِ? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, let me translate it um, literally, وَمَا يُوقَ Whoever abstains or stays away from شُحَّ نَفْسِهِ from the شُح from the inner selfishness from the inner ego, from that ego or that selfishness controlling their nafs or their own motives and their own behavior, those are the people that are going to be muflihun. Those are the, going to be the people that are going to be successful. What does that have to do with anything? That at many times, what may seem to us as a good thing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might put you in a position to get connected to it and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take it away because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted you to connect not to the matter that you missed but to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to realize your own your own weakness as a human realizing your own weakness as a human is the level of al ubudiyah the level of al ubudiyah and that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about وَعِبَادُ الرَّحْمَانِ الَّذِينَ يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هَوْنَ The servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when they walk, they walk with hawna. They, they, their gait, their walk is in a certain humble gait. gait. Why is it humble? Because they realize their human weakness. They realize that there's nothing to be proud of. They realize their own human weakness. So they, when they walk, they have a certain gait. And when they connect with the pleasures around them, they realize that they should not connect with the pleasure per se itself, but they should connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took that boy out because he wanted the parents to grow in the level of tizkiyah to the level of where they're not connected to the sun, that materialistic side, but they are now connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in feeling their weakness in the level of ubudiyah with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is something where the Prophet in looking at evil, he says, um, the mu'min, the believer, is strange. All their matters all their matters, all their matters are actually good. This is not talking about that everything that happens to them is good, but this is actually talking about how a believer's perception of even the e of even evil that it goes beyond in its observation, it goes beyond the surface to see that there is a wisdom behind it and their connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes beyond the surface to see that it is all for something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has preserved for them. So right here, the Prophet ﷺ says, if something good happens to them, they connect with who? They connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In asabatu sarra'a shakar. Whenever a good matter happens to them, they will be they will be 
thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they're not connected with the materialistic part of it, but they're actually connected with the spiritual aspect. They go beyond the surface of that good thing and remember to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. La ilaha illallah. And even if an evil thing happens to them, if they're pricked by something evil, they go beyond the surface of that evil thing to see not the evil side of it, but they will hold in their anger. They will hold in their their exaggeration in, in um, uh, revealing their feelings, but they're actually in a state of sabr. They're in a state of patience. But patience era is at different levels. There's a sabr and there's a rida. A sabr with rida. A sabr, you do have anxiety, sorrow, sadness, feeling hurt on the inside, but you keep yourself disciplined and act in akhlaq, in dealing with that trauma around you or the evil thing around you, you you still maintain a certain principle. Even in the way you express your sorrow, you maintain a, a disciplined way in expressing your feelings. Irrida is different. Irrida is a higher level of sabr. Why? Because irrida actually goes farther where you are happy you go through a trauma but you're so content and looking beyond the trauma that they're actually enjoying the trauma can you enjoy the trauma does that make sense does it make sense to enjoy a trauma does that make sense it's, it's an oxymoron almost, right? Appreciate the benefits, right? What? Appreciate the benefits of that trauma because you can, you can see growth. Well, the here's the thing. Is that, remember the class when we talked about believing in the unseen? Believing in the unseen? What, what, is, what, what is that? You see, there are certain things, there are certain levels of Iman. There's a level of Iman where you're looking at the rationality part of it. I bear witness that there's no God worthy of worship but Allah. I looked at the, the, the world around me and I managed to see by looking at the pattern around me that there's no God worthy of worship but Allah. That's an observation. I, I came to the rationality of seeing that. But in Iman is a different level. Al-Iman is a different level. How is it Iman a different level? Al-Iman, in the hadith, Jibreel alayhi salam, remember, who says, when Jibreel alayhi salam came face to face with the Prophet salam, his legs, his, his knees, right in front of the Prophet salam's knees, and what did he say? He says, Ya Muhammad, Islam. Muhammad, tell me about Islam. And he says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa Muhammad Rasulullah wa taqeem as-salat tu'ti zakat What is that? This is more of an action. Tuqim as-salat tu'ti zakat this is more of an action. You saw the pattern, you understood the rationality part of it, now you put in an action. But did it necessarily go deep? Not necessarily. And that's why he says, قَالَ فَأَخْبِرْنِي عَنِ الْإِيمَانِ He says, well, tell me about Iman. And then he says about Iman, he says, أَن تُؤْمِنَ بِاللَّهِ وَمَلَائِكَتِهِ وَكُتُبِهِ وَرُسِكَ ورس... All these, this is supposed to be part of the unseen. This is part of Al-Ghayb. تُؤْمِنَ بِاللَّهِ the angel, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the malaika, the books, the qada wal qadar. This is supposed to be the unseen. Wait a minute. What about the first one? The first one was tashhada, to see. And the second one was to believe, even if it's unseen. So what is that type of faith? That type of faith is a never another level where you go beyond the surface to the point that your heart started believing and seeing things as they as if they could see them because the first one was to see that shahad observation the second one was to believe in a where you're going beyond the surface where you could actually feel it 
What's the evidence? The evidence continued the hadith. قَالَ فَأَخْبِرْنِي عَنِ الْإِحْسَانِ Tell me about Ihsan. And he says, أَن تَعْبُدَ اللَّهَ كَأَنَّكَ تَرَى It's when you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you can see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if you can't see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can see you. What happens? We're looking at levels of seeing. That's why he says, أَن تَعْبُدَ اللَّهَ كَأَنَّكَ تَرَى It's worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if you can see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does that have to do with anything? It has to do with how we observe the world around us. That even when it comes to sabr, irrida is that you're starting to look at things in a different manner, in a different angle. You're starting to see, even when you grow in your iman, you're starting to see the unseen as if you could see it, because it became iman. When you go even a higher level, you started seeing it, Allah, you started to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if you can see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's another level. Let's go with the sabr. Sabr is holding in because I understand the rationality Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the hikmah, some wisdom behind it. But the level of rida is that you started seeing because you have deep faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you started seeing that trauma as khair. For a random person, this is an oxymoron. This is a contradictory. It can't happen. A trauma is still, go, is still going to be defined as a trauma. But for a believer, it's different. This is maybe too utopian because we didn't say it. How, how is it that somebody can see a trauma and actually say, Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had taken my child. This is... This is almost unimaginable to think of, hey, even the Prophet ﷺ, when his own son died, he cried. He teared. He was human. What about Prophet Yaqub's story? Yeah, Prophet Yaqub's story. Yes, when he had, you know, the tearing kept on going for many, many years, and, you know, and, it, it, and the damaging his eyes. And his Actually, was... it didn't, uh, here, the Prophet um, Yaqub ﷺ, it's not necessarily that he was crying so much that damaged his ears. But the anxiety and the depression or sadness and the sorrow affected his body so much that it affected his sight. But it was, I mean, he, he had used the word sabr to describe his, you, Absolutely. His state, not, not rida. Right? Absolutely. You can have rida. Rida, mm -hmm. you can have it. But when we talk about, I just put a few days ago, a post, I don't know if you saw it. No, that is sabr. <laughs> okay. That is sabr. Is sabr is a bitter a bitter taste that you could you you feel in your throat. Your body wants to object it, vomit it, but you have no choice but to swallow it. This is sabr. You have no choice, and that's why Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says wa bashir sabri. And bring glad tidings to those sabirin, to the people that are patient. When we talk about sabr, it's not that Prophet Yaqub alayhi salam was not patient. He was patient. And he did have deep, deep faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He knew. But in the end is that you can have all the riba, but your body can react to the traumas around it in different ways. And that's why he lost his sight. To continue. فَخَشِينَ أَن يُرْهِقَهُمَا طُغْيَانَ وَكُفْرًا That the man, kill, the man kills the boy because he was fearful. فَخَشِينَ In other words, he got some ilm from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That that boy, if you were to live long, that was going to cause a lot of tughyan, that his parents were going to go beyond the limits, and they're in fact, they're going to go against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and even commit kufr. فَأَرَضْنَا أَن يُبْدِلَهُمَا رَبُّهُمَا خَيْرًا مِنْهُ زَكَاةً Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to replace, instead of that boy, an elevation in their spirituality. وَأَقْرَبَ رُحْمَا وَأَقْرَبَ رُحْمَا Meaning that they were actually close in their mercy to Allah, close to the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted them to even near. This is, you know, 
story, um, one of my one of the students that I used to teach died of cancer. Five year old girl, and whenever I read about the death of a child, this it always reminds me of that family. I must admit, you know, I was when I even saw the girl when they we were doing dua for her. Um, she was five years old, very smart, very vibrant. Both parents are doctors. Didn't realize that their daughter was was um, uh, was actually um, was actually sick. Didn't even see anything. It wasn't until one uh, uh, one other doctor that saw her playing and noticed that she had some lump on her um, on her ankle and then put her hand on it, pediatrician, of course, and said, right now, go take your daughter. I'm not comfortable with what I'm seeing. Same day, she gets diagnosed. Same day, they discover that she's actually a stage four cancer. Same day, that fast. Same day, father, the, the father is actually the head of the department. Father's is a, one of the best doctors. But subhanAllah, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills something, he'll blind you, even if you're the head of the department. But that family had really, they really taught me a lot. I go and, um, and, you know, I couldn't handle my tears really seeing her bald and pale face and all that and I do the dua and I keep going to the bathroom just because I don't want to show my tears. And I would do the dua and the girl is there, but I couldn't, I couldn't cope. Then I get a phone call telling me that um, she's going through um, a hard time. And the mother calls me and she says, I want you to come over because she only has two weeks to live. I don't know the, the, the full story. But later I know of the story that um, the father does, you know, go and the mother and father, they both work with getting her chemotherapy, all those different therapies, trying to help her out, etc. But the father realized, looks at the x-ray after doing all that chemotherapy and realized, well, he's anyway specialized in respiratory, um, respiratory medicine. So looks at the looks the x-ray and then says to his wife, your daughter only has two weeks to live. Unimaginable to actually be in that position where you as a doctor, you know that there's no hope. Sometimes not having any knowledge and believing that doctors will still help me, sometimes ignorance is, is a blessing. But he knew that, no. Then says, that's it. Let's just take her home. Take out all the IVs, take everything. Mom, your child, this is her last moments. I get a phone call and she says, Aisha, please come over. Our daughter is in her last days. I said, all right. Got the phone call at 11 at night and that a few hours later, 5 a.m., I get the phone call. Um, can you please come now at 5 a.m.? I thought I was going to go, you know, support. You know, I know she's dying. So then the mother says, no, she actually died. Now, I go in there, and mashallah, their house is like a mansion, huge house. And I go in there, and the girl is resting on the bed dead of course and they don't approach her but I get near and I close her eyes and do the position that she's supposed to be in and wallahi the smell of milk was burned now the mother was telling me that the mother was telling me that the, that the girl was telling her, they're all here, they're all here. Every, they're telling me that they're taking me somewhere nice. This is the girl telling her mom. 
and she says, sweetheart, it's only me and your sister that are here. She says, no, don't you see them? They're all here. And the girl was so happy. And she was telling her of all the different things she was seeing. And of course, we know that the malaika are present. And we know that if a child dies, that they're actually that they're actually going to be um, taken to Jannah. I mean, that's a hadith. Now, the father, I'm, I must admit, I'm actually looking for napkins because I'm trying to put myself together and I'm crying. And the mother is the one that's handing me the napkins. Wallahi al-Azim. So I said, Maryam, you know, mashallah, you're doing a great job being patient. And then she told me, this is my fourth child that dies. Her fourth child. I cannot imagine. You know, you could, you could give lectures about patience, but patience is not a lecture to give. The father comes in holding himself and trying to hold himself from crying and he says I'm trying to hold my tears I please is it okay to cry and I said you can cry but you can't scream and that's when he bursts in his tears but subhanallah the amount of patience that they actually shown when this is their fourth child another day I was actually teaching in their home and I'm hearing moaning in 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 the house it's it's a big house and I said I was telling Maryam who's actually the mother I said is there crying in the background what's what's going on and she said, yes, that's my husband. That was six months after the death of the girl, or the girl's death. And she said, yeah, that's my husband. I could, I could hear somebody crying. And then he said, can I ask her if I could talk to her? And he taught me one thing. He said, you know, after the death of my child, I started seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I said, I don't understand what you mean. He said, after the death of my child, I started seeing every single thing around me as really nothing but this whole world in front of me is nothing. It's only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I saw my weakness. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the reason why I'm saying this is that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was telling us in the story that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted them to grow in their spirituality, in their purification. And that, that man, you know, he said, I never felt so close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until that day when I lost my heart. I realized that I, all these things around me, I don't see them anymore. And all I can connect with is really see my weakness and realize my weakness and through my weakness I can see the magnificence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that's that's the story that I'll never forget because patience and trauma like I said it's not a lecture to give many times we could see patience and only think of the trauma and the evil and that why me? We may not realize. And this is one reason why, whether in the Muslim community or the non-Muslim community, depression is on the rise because tazkiyah is not taught. I know that depression can sometimes be related to our own, just like Prophet Yaqub alayhi salam, who because of the depression and the sorrow that he was in lost his sight. This is this is one side of us as humans. But one very important thing to teach 
and to discipline and to purify our hearts from seeing the materialistic side of, of trauma to seeing it through the lens of tazkiyah, through the lens of dhikr, through the lens. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was talking about when, when it comes to trauma, that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually, actually tells us um, that those that face the trauma, الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَبَتْهُمْ مُصِيبَةٌ قَالُوا إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ There is a different vision. When a trauma happens, they say, إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ They put all the trauma in a perspective. The perspective is that we're all going to return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in the end, is that they use salah, they use dhikr, in order to help with that sorrow, with that because Allah bi dhikrillahi tatma'inu al qulub. With tama'ina, to get to the tama'ina, you need the dhikr. You need the dhikr. But when there's no dhikr, when there's no tazkiyah, not only depression, but suicide is going to be going up just like a non Muslim community. Because when we think of hijab as just a cloth to put on, or when we think of salah as just movements to practice, did we really understand Tazkiyah? Did we really get to see Islam more than a surface, but to actually get to the level of Iman? That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in this surah that when we look at trauma, there's a different angle that you see trauma in. And that it's, it's, it's actually increasing your Tazkiyah and increasing your nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَأَمَّا الْجِدَارُ As for الْجِدَار, as for that wall, فَكَانَ لِغُلَامَيْنِ يَتِيمَيْنِ It was for two young boys. غُلَامَيْنِ They didn't even reach the age of puberty. They were orphans. فِي الْمَدِينَةِ They were in that city. Notice, before it was... Before Al Medina, before it was calling it what? Before it was calling it Aqariya. Right? It was calling it Aqariya. Now it's calling it a Medina. Al Medina, um, we can see it right here. That Al Medina, the whole city, the whole city was was living in a certain culture. And that culture was based on a certain certain greed. So, في المدينة وكان تحته كنز لهما that he realized with his farasa when he asked for food from that city and they refused to give him food. Remember, they refused. فأبوا أن يضيفوهما they refused to give them food. He realized from that move that these people are very centered. They're very centered on materialism. They're very centered on benefit. They're very centered. And they might they might even transgress their limits where they could even take other people's properties if they can. And these two orphan boys, they were in the city. No one was there to protect their income or interest or no one was there to protect their only source of income. The children didn't know anything about that income. The children didn't know anything about it. But at least no one is there to know. So, There was money underneath that wall that was kept for those two orphan boys, not the city. And not the boys knew about it. But if that wall would fall, it was going to reveal what was hidden underneath. And what was the city going to do? They were going to take it over. They were going to cop it all up. وَكَانَ أَبُوهُمَا صَالِحًا Allah عَلِيكَ كَانَ أَبُوهُمَا صَالِحًا And their father 
was a pious one. Some scholars said that the father was pious. It was an ancestor, some kind of a generation back that they were pious. And because they were pious, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was there to look out for their children. Ya Allah. This gives me the goosebumps. Because many times you may not realize you fear for your children, but you be the pious person and Allah Ta'ala will take over. You may die, something might happen to you, but you preserve the piety and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will be the one to preserve the piety even when you're not there. An amazing story I once heard. One of the girls that studies, um, what that used to attend Gems of Light. Um, she's Sudanese. And her father was actually married. Her father was a revert. Ready for the story? Father was a revert, but the father was Sudanese. So I said, how is it that your father was Sudanese and a revert, but his, his dad was Muslim? She told me an amazing story. She told me his father was actually a Muslim. He came to the U.S. in the 60s. Study, married a non-Muslim woman. The father dies, the father dies, and when his son was only 12 years old. But uh, the father was always concerned to raise his son to be Muslim. But the father died. And we're talking about America in the 60s. No place, no message it to go to and know those things that barely existed in fact islam was not even known it was thought of some kind of a strange religion etc some middle eastern faith and it was only the nation of islam that they had heard of during the 60s so totally different the father the son sorry the father died he got killed he got shot aside father's gone Boy is 12 years old. Boy becomes Catholic because I'm a Catholic. At the age of 30 some years old, he decides he wanted to learn what his father's faith was. And at 30 some years old, he becomes Muslim. He becomes Muslim. He becomes Muslim. And later all his children, mashallah, become Muslim and mashallah I mean it's mashallah very you see the father is gone killed in a homicide but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was there to bring guidance you can work so hard to guide your children but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you be there for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be there ihfadillaha yahfadhk ihfadillaha tajidhu tujahak Preserve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's limits. Preserve the limits of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala set on ground and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will preserve you. Always keep Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your, in your memory. Remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You'll find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wherever you go. And right here, كَانَ أَبُوهُمَا صَالِحًا Because their, their father or their, their great-grandfather was a pious man, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was there to preserve those two orphans, not only in their deen, but even in their dunya. Even in their dunya. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was there. وَكَانَ أَبُوهُمَا صَالِحًا That is the main reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had sent that man or Prophet Musa and that man to put up the wall. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was wanting to save something for them for their dunya and their akhirah. 
You wear, you worry about your children. You be the person. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will work his way. Not even in you, but even in preserving your children. Preserving your children's deen. Preserving your children's life, etc. فَأَرَادَ رَبُّكَ أَيَّ بِلُغَ أَشُدَّهُمَا فَأَرَادَ رَبُّكَ And your Lord wanted that they would reach أَشُدَّهُمَا They would reach the age of puberty, their power, their full strength وَيَسْتَخْرِجَا كَنْزَهُمَا And then they'll be able to take that wealth. Once they are strong enough to defend, protect themselves, and even protect their wealth, and no one can transgress their limits and take advantage of their weakness as orphans. Rahmatam min Rabbik. That's the mercy of your Lord. وَمَا فَعَلْتُهُ عَنْ أَمْرِي وَمَا فَعَلْتُهُ عَنْ أَمْرِي I did not do this based on my own matter, meaning my own observation, meaning my own experience. No. This is an issue that you will not be able to be patient. You, you, weren't, you, weren't, you didn't get patient enough to wait until you get to the final theme, to the final lesson. You rush things. What do we get out of these stories? One is that you may see things on the surface and not realize that what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is keeping for you is a lot more, but it's just a matter of patience. Wait. The whole story is about patience. The whole story is to understand that you may see things looking from the surface that it's nothing but evil. If that's some, a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a human, acting on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how is it when you have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doing the job for you? When you have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doing the job for you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us and giving us that hikmah Connect with the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and learn how to correct your vision and your observation from the surface to seeing with your own faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only does things with complete hikmah because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-hakim. That's when you'll have your trust and never lose your own self or your own faith because of a of a trauma that you might have come across. You don't know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is preserving for you. It could be increasing faith. It could be increasing dunya. But not because you want it now. It doesn't mean it is right for you. It may be the wrong time. You don't have all the data of seeing the whole picture. Being patient is the whole theme of this lesson. Another part is that when you could see that how talab al-ilm, talab al-ilm and seeking and acquiring ilm, it has to take different stages. The stage of being patient, the stage of having be, and having a tawadu' and being humble, because you cannot have ilm if you see yourself above them, above others, and that others should learn from you, no matter who you are, even if you have all the PhD. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have contained ilm. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to even teach Prophet Musa alayhi salam that even if you are a prophet, even if you're a prophet, I might have given the ilm that you don't have to somebody that is not even a prophet. That's where we learn how to be humble. Ilm Ilm gets lost between two things. Il kibr, pride, il shyness. 
If you're going to be shy to seek ilm, then you're going to lose it. Al-kibr is being self-centered, centered around your ego, centered around your own self and seeing yourself as the center of knowledge or the center of goodness and that what you are doing is always right. When the person goes through al-kibr, that story is a story for us to learn how sometimes it's not just an issue of what ilm you get, but there are things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give others with dhikr and can give others even if they may not have the degree, even if it's the degree of being a prophet or a degree of a PhD, that other people can have the ilm and the skill to deliver things or can have the skill or ilm in experience and this is something I always say you might have PhDs but you gotta be humble to respect your parents experience you gotta be humble to respect all the amount and all the effort that they put in to make you who you are because that the effort that you the effort that you spent in studying it would not have been there if it wasn't for your parents to be there to give you the time to give you the determination and to keep you on track if we're not going to have that principle instilled as part of the tazkia we will definitely lose in our in our different levels of Tezkiyah. Tezkiyah is different levels. Tezkiyah is at different levels where it begins in the beginning with realization. But even with realization, you got to put in some effort of work, action. But even that, it still requires a lot. And Iman is different than Islam. Because in Islam, you're still it's just an issue of observation and you're putting in some some ibadah but it doesn't necessarily mean that that person gained the ilm I always say a story when my professor my professors when I went for Kulit al-Sharia and I was and I went for Kulit al-Sharia you know the story went for Kulit al-Sharia and I thought I was going to, to see great professors and those professors are going to be you know sahaba and then I realized that my professors were not Sahaba as I thought. So I turned to Sifat al-Safra, a book mainly about the Salihin. They were always getting miracles, always getting miracles, always getting karamat. So I thought all it needed was me to add on more hijabs, more jalabi, more clothes, more dhikr. Read Qul of Allahu Ahad a thousand times. More do more qiyam al And be really sincere when you make a dua, you know, cry. And if you, if you can't cry, fake the tears until they come. But I didn't get a miracle. I went to my professor, mentioned that story. Went to my professor. And I said, you know, I couldn't see the, I couldn't see the, the, the miracles that I was expecting to see. I mean, when Israel got some miracles, why can't I get some too? Karamat, just like that in that book. I should get something. And then he told me, what karamat did you want? And I was like, well, the ant to sing and the bug to, to dance or something like that. It was something like that. And he said, you didn't see the miracles or any miracles around you? I said, no. He said, you didn't see the, sun, the stars, the sun, the sky, anything. I, I said that those, I, those are normal things. He said normal. He said Bani Israel got extraordinary miracles. That was because فَإِنَّهَا لَا تَعْمَلْ أَبْصَرُ وَلَكَنْ تَعْمَلْ قُلُوبُ الَّتِي فِي الصُّدُورِ Their sight were so blind from seeing the miracle. Their hearts were so blind from seeing the miracles that even their sight didn't even realize it. So I said, where were where the, I expected the professors to be my role models, and he said, you be the role model that you wish to see. 
and you wish to find. And when we look at a sabr, what does that have to do with that? When we look at a sabr, you have to be humble. No matter how far you go with your ilm, with your, with your money, with your fame, with any of that. Some people can be those people to listen to the halaqa and they would be the ones to have their dua answered, not yours. Some people, they would be the ones, you know, the one of the salihin was asked, who's better, you or the dog? And he said, I can't answer the question now. Come back to me on my deathbed. If I die as a mu'min, I'll tell you I'm better than the dog. But if I die as a disbeliever, then the dog is better than me. Because at least he was obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You see, seeking ilm requires sabr. Two, is sabr for is-sama'ah. Is-sama'ah is different than an istima'ah. In the beginning, you're listening to the lecture and you can probably get 60% of what was heard. Because the rest of it, it sounded like somebody is mumbling. But it isn't until you become into the second level of an istima'ah, which is tentative listening. You're listening, you're hearing, you're processing. Number, number three, which is il hifadh, to memorize. Take the time to memorize what you're learning. Take notes to keep track of what you're learning. Four, that's when it goes into trying to expand with al hafath trying to get the different sciences and trying to put in trying to put in those fields in order to bring about a complete picture of that ilm and that comes with al mulazama that comes with al mulazama what is al mulazama al mulazama is to be consistent to be consistent with the scholars taking from this scholar and that scholar and that scholar and listening for, because here's one thing every single scholar is going to be repeating a number of things just like you guys notice sometimes I would repeat certain things every single person is going to be repeating certain things no matter what scholar you go to so you go to one scholar and then another and then a third that's il mulazama having that mulazama but be careful, no matter how great that scholar is, they're still human. They still have faults. They will still have areas where they're weak on. And that's where you would have to, with the ulazama, get the ilm that you need. And then the areas that you feel is missing, that's what you do to cover up. And that's where you grow beyond by completing and you being the role model that you wish to see. Muhammad. It's actually 3.37. I'm late for picking up my kids. Well, <laughs> we'll come back inshallah next week. And tonight, inshallah, uh, fiqh of marriage. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.